Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at What Not, number one through four. A comic published by Fanagraphics Press between 1993 and 94, featuring the really nice artwork of Jeremy Eaton. Also, pretty damn good writing, too. Uh, Jeremy Eaton had a syndicated uh, strip in alternative newspapers. I think it probably had a circulation of like 10 papers at most, called A Sleepyhead Tale. Fanographics collected a bunch of those into two different collections, I believe. Maybe they did more. I don't know. Uh, on top of that, Jeremy Eaton even did an Eros comic for Fanographics, uh, Hump Crazy, which I have, but I haven't reread in a while. But it's just really bizarre because this guy's a very, let's just say, heady uh, cartoonist. He just crams lots of clever business in every panel. Um, definitely seems to know a lot about everything. So it's kind of amazing that he did a porno comic. But uh, let's crack these open. These are really fun. Number one here, we have a little panorama of a lot of the characters we're going to meet inside. And this is the host of the strip, the artist, who's trademarked, by the way. So uh, whenever you use the term the artist, you owe Jeremy Eaton a nickel. <clears throat> Little inside uh, front cover. And here's the artist introducing us to the comic. And this uh, first comic continues that. It's uh, just who in the hell is going to buy this comic book? And basically it's the artist... Uh, telling us uh, why you should read this comic. <coughs> Excuse me. Swallowed wrong there. <coughs> Whoa. Now we have the rose-colored man, and there's a few of these strips within this series. And I love this, how it's like this very, I don't know, it reminds me of almost like the New Yorker, like a, a very sophisticated style of cartooning. But the rose-colored man's very foul. He's, he finds this baby in a garbage can. And he says, oh, who did this to you? A wicked witch or a great big ogre? And the kid says, no, it was mommy and daddy who put me in here. And he says, such an imagination. And he laughs and throws it back in the garbage can and walks away. <laughs> it's kind of par for the course. Burlesque Theater presents Limbo and his little pal, pal Seedy. This is a regular uh, character. I think he's in a sleepyhead tale. And this is just a very uh, goofy vaudeville type gag. Man, I love his cartooning. And his just panels, everything, his logos. Jeremy to me looks so good. I wish the writing lived up to the cartooning. I mean, it's pretty damn good writing. But this cartooning to me is just top of the line. And his writing is pretty darn good, but... You know, I've read better. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's not as great as this art, because I love his art. This is a nice one. Uh, it's a fake ad for falsies. So if you like reading superhero comics or funny animal comics, you can put this little uh, overlay, which will make it look like you're reading some hip alternative comic, even though the dialogue stays the same. Take that, you miserable worm. And then it looks like some kind of Peter Bag, <laughs> Ivan Brunetti thing. Take that, you miserable worm. Significant TV. And this is a, a regular feature. The host is Sig Static. And he tells us about some uh, TV shows only he seems to remember, basically. And... Uh, they're really clever. They're just really, um, they make up these fake TV shows. Or I'm sorry, he does. And then they really like give you the whole history of it. So this first one is called Giant Hitler, which is a very popular Japanese uh, television show. And basically it seems like uh, Hitler was a big kaiju in this. And they tell us about the actresses and the actors. The product spun off from Giant Hitler. Giant Hitler toffees. Giant Hitler diarrhea medicine. They tried to make an English version, but it failed after only 14 episodes. 
They were sued by an Indonesian company claiming that giant Hitler had unfairly appropriated their 1951 art film, The 40 Foot Fuhrer. <laughs> so like every panel is packed with this fake, funny history. It's amazing how many jokes he crams into here. Here's a little one page weird uh, strip. Walt Whitman superhero daydream. <laughs> I love this. Walt Whitman is having a daydream. He's a superhero. He's fighting this other maybe supervillain. And then they start making out. But then the comics go to Thority Stamp, censors his dream. And he wakes up and he says, damn. <laughs> hey gals, are you actively repulsed by the sperm splashing male froth that clings to our beloved Mother Earth? Here's another fake ad for this pamphlet or book, which basically is a a guide to common American idiots, asshole, assholes, and geeks. So it's a, if you're like a man hating woman, this will show you who to avoid. The worst of the worst of men. These are pretty well observed, pretty funny. Goth guys, Seattle grunge guys. Here's another fun strip where uh, we see this couple making love. She says, why can't I be on top tonight? He says, it's business, baby. She says, but I'm getting calluses. And you're like, what the hell are they talking about? And then we see, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing sexual Mr. E. And so they're connected. <laughs> so she always has to be on the bottom, standing on her hands. We have a fake letter page here, since there's no letters yet. Oh my God, I just have to comment this. Walnuts is a parody, a beatnik parody of Peanuts. I went to Walden Pond yesterday to kill myself. You didn't do a very thorough job. <laughs> oh my God, foul ball. Okay, now we have the first chapter of Americaville. This is such a weird comic. I kind of like it. I. It's very Lynchian where, yeah, it doesn't all make sense. But each individual scene has some interesting, I don't know, something about it. It's uh, it's kind of interesting. So we see this guy, he's rubbing his eye. He's got eye boogers. And we see that he saves them in a jar. Then we see this naked woman who's uh, writing some weird stuff. And she's got a baby in a birdcage with a little hole in the op opening. And this image is so bizarre to me. She just sticks her booby in so the baby can suckle her. Next we see this factory and we see this uh, toy soldier, like the kids kind of we used to play with, you know, with the base here made in the USA. And he's crawling down this corridor. Next we see this truck going down a highway Right in the middle of the road is this weird um, uh, pansexual character. I don't, I don't know what sex they are. And the truck goes right through them. So they're like a ghost. Next we see this guy. I don't know what the hell he's doing. And we hear this applause. Next we see the guy from the, I believe the guy from the first page taking pictures of his poops in the toilet. And one of them is uh, very striking to him. It, this particular shape, because it reminds him, I assume it's him when he's a little boy, a psychiatrist was showing him Rorschach blots. And it looked just like his poop here. Just very creepy. This uh, psychiatrist has no legs. Just sliced off. And one of the Rorschach blots makes the kid cry. He collects his tears in a test tube and drinks, drinks them. We see that naked lady again. And I guess there's a naked man in her house. She tears up what she was writing in the typewriter. 
And the sneaking man goes up to her with a paddle and just whomps her in the face. And then we see this bandaged creature making strange noises to be continued. Now we have uh, another little fake ad. 2492. Apparently this weirdo looks very much like a Frank Quitley character. <laughs> like Flexman Tylo mixed with, the, I don't know, some other weird dude. And uh, this guy supposedly knows what the future will bring. Experience the prohibition of all internal organs. Shock yourself with the tab taboo of man and mineral couplings. Marvel at the counter-revolution of the Richard Milhouse Nixon robots. <laughs> this looks so good to me. I love his cartoon. And we have another rose-colored man where he's being cruel. So the inside back covers have ads for A Sleepy Head Tale, the Fantagraphics collection I was mentioning. And they're all like whiskey and another strip. He draw each one's unique, has a great drawing, some funny jokes. I like this back cover. I invite you to piss on me. Live performance art by Salvador Smith. And we see this guy. I think he's a paraplegic. People are pissing on him. He's happy. And then someone takes a dump on his face and he says, critics. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So now we have what not number two. Cover uh, on the cover is Sleepyhead from a Sleepyhead tale. So this is a little crossover. And uh, Sleepyhead is billed as the country's 649th most popular cartoon character. Another greetings from uh, the artist. Get a nice little gag strip. Man, this one is just, this art just fucking freaks me out it's so good the dreaming yank we see this guy he's he's like ah nutritious nutritious red apple the perfect bedtime snack and he goes to sleep and then all of a sudden he starts having this nightmare look at this panel here it's like his brain is bubbling out of his skull and then he's vomiting this horrible whatever the hell that is it's almost like his intestines are coming out his guts explode out of his stomach. And then this panel is just fucking gorgeous. Well, it's repulsive, but it's gorgeous as well. And then he wakes up in horror and realizes he forgot to wash the apple. And that's why it's such a bad dream. We get a couple of two-thirds page strips. So this uh, little boy strip can run in the bottom. Little boy starring in Founders Keepers. Little boy is a recurring character. And he's just, you know, typical Dennis the Menace, but with times 10, you know, like he's this horrible little shit. In this one, he digs up his grandfather's skull. I love the way he draws him. He just looks so malevolent, this little kid. This one totally looks like a different style. Is it about raisins? Here's another fake ad. And this is a this is a sleazy comic book company. Maybe it's Revolutionary Comics, enticing young artists to basically sleep on their floor and draw comics really cheap for them. It's really funny. I'm not gonna. I can't read the whole thing, but it's really good. Here's another significant TV with Sig Static. This one's called Half MD. Apparently, in Asia and India, well. I always forget India is part of Asia. In fact, I just found that out five years ago or so, and I'm 56. I never, I always thought India was part of like the Middle East, but uh, that shows how good my teachers were in school. So apparently there was this, uh, a very popular uh, Bombay, I'm sorry, Indian TV show called Captain Attention about a bisexual man who's a cop. So apparently this caused this big uh, trend. So Half MD uh, came out from this uh, trend. Actually starred a real uh, bisection person who somehow survived. 
This is so weird. But I love how he does such attention to detail. You could almost, almost believe that maybe this is real. Like he tells you the name of the company that makes it and what year it came out. You know, like, it's almost like, wait a second, maybe he's not lying. But obviously this is uh, can't be real. Curse of the stained glass window. This is so much fun. I guess uh, Jeremy Eaton found some of his old papers and stuff from when he was a kid. And he found a little story written by his 10-year-old self. <laughs> so he illustrates it now. One day at a church, a priest was making a speech in front of many people. When the stained glass window on top of his head smashed and fell to the ground, it hit his head and killed him very badly. This kept on happening. He keeps all the misspellings in, by the way. This kept on happening in many, many churches until all stained glass windows were banded from earth. <laughs> it continues, but that's the gist of it. I love this idea. This next one is another fake advertisement. And this is about, a, it's called Dirty Mouth. And basically it's like, has being overly polite and uh, you know having a clean mouth kept you back? Learn how to curse with our method. So supposedly if you curse more, you'll become successful. We'll see this woman later. She pops up in other strips. <laughs> I like this. In your in your home, your tea, Mr. Mammoth, ass fuck fucking ass. And the butler's thinking, a genius. On the job, the curse symbols. No, fuck you, Mr. Dithers. <laughs> And I love this at the beach. It's that old Charles Atlas ad. You goddamn shithole, motherfuck. Gosh. It totally makes the bullies step back. So here we have a sleepyhead tale. The myth of America. God, this art is so nice. This Look at the lettering. Everything about this is great. So sleepyhead is basically telling us and everything we've been taught about American history is a lie. And he proceeds to tell us the real truth. And it's all these just very silly, nonsensical uh, facts about American history. Paper money is made from zebra tongues. Orville and Wilbur Wright painted the White House with their own spittle. Neil Armstrong wrote Ulysses. Just, it's just tons of shit like that. Pretty silly. Here's that lady again. We have a nice little strip of, of Puppet Christ. This is actually quite profound. Um, it's Eddie Egg. Man, this issue is just crammed with so much different stuff. A little gag strip by the Soleil character. Fake ad for thousands of tiny artists. Hundreds of different poses. Loitering, mooching, whining, vomiting. A real letter page now. And we have chapter two of Americaville. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see that toy soldier again. He's in this hot, I guess it's a hospital, a VA hospital. And everyone's just laughing at him. And we find out that he got his arm ripped off in war. Even though he's a toy soldier, I guess he represents a real soldier, or at least in his, his head, he has these memories of being a real soldier. And back in the field of combat, he goes to a med tent, like a mash unit, and once again, everyone's just laughing at him. Nobody will help him. He sees this, uh, it looks like the enemy, like, you know, an Asian uh, peasant carrying this trunk sorry, this uh, cartload of body parts and he goes to reach for an arm to replace his and the local guy pulls a gun on him and says, get the hell out of here. And then we kind of pull back and now we see this woman with a baby on board t-shirt running in fear of her life. And we see that uh, weird, crazy uh, hobo person again. She runs right through them, because remember, they're like a ghost. And then we see this guy, the baby is pointing up. I guess he's this horrible, immature man. 
and he's running after the pregnant woman with a broken bottle. And then we see this guy. We switch to this scene. I don't know why I, I love this. It's so interesting. He's uh, going by this fence. There's a hole about like six feet up. Shampoo rins one one dollar. And I guess this guy is getting his head shampooed from these mysterious hands coming from a, a hole. Then the next hole's a little lower. Shirts buttoned, 50 cents. <laughs> And then the hole's a little lower, about waist level. It says, your pleasure, 29 cents. And he looks inside. It's this horrible, ogre-like looking person with their mouth wide open. And then the last one is very low, the hole. It says, lace is tied. <laughs> I don't know why that charms me so much. It's so odd and interesting. And so this guy makes it to his apartment and he's talking to his, his love and we find out that it's a sex doll. There's some more mysterious panels. And now we're back with that naked couple. And we see the husband's face, or the, I'm sorry, the man's face more clearly. He's almost like a Mr. Potato Head. He's got all these holes and she takes out the My Perfect Husband kit. You know, just like Mr. Potato Head. And she puts in the mouth and all the other parts. So now he looks like this. And uh, then she has a little, little Miss Peep dress for the baby. And she dresses the baby up. And then we still see that creature writhing in bandages. Have a little one page strip, very odd. And another fake advertisement. This is for Betsy and Ben, the Liberty Twins. They're, they're the spokes uh, models for Imperial Confections Company. Betsy and Ben fly all, oh, sorry, fly all over the world looking for children who don't have sugar, corn syrup, and artificial flavoring. So they go around the world giving candy to these starving. Uh, foreigners. They give uh, these starving kids candy. And the kid says, but this will not help us. It will only make us dependent on you. We are starving and unable to defend ourselves against a neighbor who steals our fertile land with all the weapons you gave him. Obviously a comment on uh, America. Some more fake ads. A real ad for Sleepyhead Tale of Whatnot number one, but with some more jokes. And then we have a rose colored man back cover. This one, he sees some newspapers lying on the ground. He says, Ah, the Sunday funnies. I haven't read these in so long. Let me just grab these. And he takes them off this poor sleeping hobo who is using them for warmth. A bastard. What not number three, another great cover. This is the little what not special. So it's kind of uh, all these uh, kid comics, but believe me, they're not for kids. It's still a mature reader's title. I really like this cover. His covers look so fun to me. Like just the logo is amazing. I love his, his logo. And they're just crammed with so much fun images and stuff. They have a little contest announcement here. So now we have Little Boy in Kill Fairyland. So uh, we're in a schoolroom. Little Boy is reading, it looks like some like violent comic book, Mr. 5x5. Five Five. He's in the Sleepyhead Tale. He appears every now and then. So the teacher says, oh, this is not proper. Why don't read this book, Fairyland? So it's a total insipid kitty comic. But in little kid's mind, little boy's mind, he changes it using his imagination. And all of a sudden, Mr. 5x5 five five shows up and he's got a bazooka and they're killing all the fairies and the elves and the critters from fairyland. And he just starts wigging out 
<laughs> He's just like so into his violent fantasy. And the teacher pulls it away and says, I can't understand why this Fairyland book would cause such an extreme reaction. And in the background, he's strangling a little kid. You have another rose-colored man. Being a weirdo again. This one's great. It's a, it's My Naked Lady. And it's very much like a Maury Sendak send-up. All, the, um, all of these uh, panels rhyme. This little boy finds a pack of those racy de uh, tra uh, not trading cards, sorry, playing cards. And the naked lady on one of them appears. And he says, I'm going to take you home. <laughs> and it's basically like having this great new friend. He's so happy that he has a naked lady all to himself. His mother's thrilled and invites her to tea. All of the neighborhood children come by and play with the naked lady. And then she reads him a story before bedtime. Fast asleep and dreaming bright, Dan's naked lady tucks him in tight. She comes close and whispers near, It's been a lovely day, thank you, dear. <laughs> this is such a weird Freudian uh, thing. Like, it just seems like, even though little kids don't even know what to do with a naked lady, I think every little boy would love their own naked lady. It would, it would make them all happy. What might transpire if the child stars of Cartoon Land actually grew up into hideously re regular people? <laughs> These are pretty funny. Oh my god. What's her name? Little Lotta? She uh, has to hire male prostitutes to have sex with her. And uh, we see Buster Brown roasting Tig, his dog. I guess it was the Depression. Oh, no, this came out way before the Depression. Never mind. <laughs> and then we see Jeffy from Family Circus in a freak show in a zoo. See, Jeffy. Poke, spit on. Jeffy, the 78-year-old boy. I like how uh, Nancy goes crazy because the highly simplistic cartoon environment that she lives in. Three rocks, a house, a tree. Three rocks, a house, a tree. <laughs> We have this little fake ad for uh, Zygote Fashions. Another, this is a young sleepyhead tale. Kind of funny little gag here. Another letters page. And then this is kind of fun. The artist introduces his uh, cousin, the foreign artist. He, oh, I'm sorry, artiste. And he looks pretty much just like him, except he has a white beret. And he's a cartoonist, and uh, this is the introduction to uh, the foreign artiste comic book. <laughs> this is pretty funny. It's really dopey. So basically, uh, it's written in this completely uh, butchered uh, English translated uh, diction. Green alien like to land. Farthest away in outer of space, such things explode. Most loving planet is Boom. Only me, the survivor, are escaping great total death. No more to have beauty of home. And it goes on like that in this great uh, kind of a stilted translated diction. But um, it's basically, a, it's a 50s Atlas comic, you know, sci-fi story, but written in this uh, weird way. Also, the art is like really just slightly off. I love this, how it just... It just looks like how when I, f my dementia full on uh, develops. I think my normal comics will read like this and look like this. It looks like this, is, maybe if you had schizophrenia, this is what a normal comic would look like. It would just look off and all the faces would be weird. And uh, it's in this weird format because supposedly you're supposed to cut it out and make your own little booklet. And here's the cover. Big Comic American, number one. Here we have the third chapter of Americaville. We see that naked couple again. And finally, the wrappings come off that creature. 
and it looks like a little lamb. This uh, shot that they always have of where they live, this establishing shot, totally reminds me of a, like a Beto Hernandez for some reason, like a, a radistic matter or something. And the mother goes up to the lamb and then she uh, takes the baby out of the cage. And this is so horrifying, this horrible baby in her little Miss Peep outfit. She uh, grabs the lamb and devours it. The parents clap and then the clap the applause is a transition to this scene. And this guy's kind of like the narrator of Americaville, but he doesn't really fill us in on much. He's basically just saying, uh, you know, weird, obtuse things. He's like a weird, uh, <laughs> the guy in uh, our town. <laughs> But like on acid. That guy who likes to collect is fascinated with his own bodily functions. We see him collecting blood and tears and sweat into different little receptacles. And also remembering back to when he was a little boy, the psychiatrist. Now the psychiatrist has these like features that keep disappearing and appearing. Really creepy. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, as an adult, he's sculpting this giant uh, sculpture of a, of a human. Meanwhile, back with that toy soldier, I guess his name's Private Howdy. He comes onto a clearing and he sees this general dancing with a naked, it looks like a Vietnamese woman, like this is the Vietnam War, or maybe it's Korea. And the general goes up to him and stabs a knife in his heart and then rips his heart out and him and the woman start eating it. He spits it up, he spits up a seed. Apparently his heart has a seed in it. And out of the seed, I love this panel, him growing out of the seed. It's Private Howdy with both of his arms now. So fucking weird. <laughs> Another ad with a new drawing and more jokes. This is a real ad, of course. Oh, man, I love this uh, Limbo character. So this is the uh, little version of Whatnot. So Akimbo, this is Limbo's uh, nephew. He goes to visit his uh, uncle. And it looks like his uncle shows him, like, burlesque videos or something. Very odd. I don't really get the humor, to be honest. But, man, I love this cartooning. This looks so good to me. Okay, we got number four, which is the last issue, unfortunately. And new cover format, different logo. Not sure if I like it. There's a there's a lot of differences between the first three issues and this issue. And I'll, I'll point those out as we get there. But right off the bat, the cover, I mean, that's a great striking image. Really interesting. But all the other first three covers had kind of a, you know, thing going, like a very uh, similarity to them. Lots of characters packed into a space. That great logo. Here's the results of that contest where uh, he asked readers to send in a more commercial version of the artist. Because uh, I guess the artist isn't uh, polling well with the public. Now this first door, right off the bat, the art looks very different here. And it's not bad. It's kind of fun cartooning, but it's Definitely not as like tight as the first three issues. And this is weird. The story is brought to us by SIG TV. It's a, it's a brief history of television. And it's real. It, this is all real information. Even though he throws in lots of gags. And, uh, you know, definitely draws, draws it very humorously. But as I was reading it, the first page, I was just like, oh, this is going to be all weird shit, huh? And it's like, nope. He just tells you, history of television. 
Here's some weird little amazing true TV facts. So he could be making these up. But this one seems so amazing. So during World War II, when regular British TV programming went off the air, it was right in the middle of a Mickey Mouse cartoon. When programming returned years later after the war, the same cartoon was concluded, starting up precisely where it left off, as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, that's true. That's really weird. So they talk about closed circuit TV. That's everything about TV you ever wanted to know. And uh, that's it. That's like the longest story by far we've seen. So this is quarterback, thief of ball. And this is as if it was uh, written and drawn by the foreign artiste again. It's got that same uh, tortured diction. And uh, big game of cheer at school as padded champ number nine to throw. But as uh, he's about to throw the ball, this quarterback, number nine, it is, a, it is football for throwing that speak to champ. Equipment of sports is alive and to be crying. And the ball says, help me. He's like, help me get back to my family. I don't belong here in this torture stadium. And so number nine barrels through the opposition. And uh, it's not just a game anymore. He actually barrels through them and then just runs off the field. He's going to take the football home to his, uh, his people. <laughs> the referees all chase after him. I kind of love this shit. It's so bonkers. A lot of this art reminds you of like um, bats. I always don't know if it's Matsy because the exclamation point or it's just mats. But uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting stuff. So we go, they call out the National Guard, they call out the army. Everyone's trying to stop number nine. And he goes through all these travails. And finally, the family, I guess, is in the distance. And he says, throw me towards my family. And he does. And he's very happy. Thank thank very many and much for valor to running me, champ boy. Never forget. And he's with all those other football people. And then he collapses from exhaustion. And then his helmet starts saying, hey, help me. Get me to my people. <laughs> so it's going to start all over again. So even the letter page looks so different. I mean, uh, it looks way sloppier. What notes? I like how he draws all of the, the writers. This uh, letter writer accuses him of not being punk. And so he draws her like this. Kind of funny. Another kind of looser strip, you know? Like I said, this looks very different than the first three issues. This one's so funny, though. Poetry does not pay. But he is, I believe, giving us real information. So he takes three poets and this little guy here, Vex V Verse. He's the, he's the narrator. It's almost like a, a, a Charles Byro comic or a Lev Gleason comic. But crime does not pay. So Walt Whitman basically becomes a crazy hobo in his old age. He has to borrow money from everyone. Wally Whitman died in 1892. The cause of death? Poetry. Now we see uh, Rambo, Arthur Rambo, and uh, he, he dies very young. The cause of death? Poetry. Then we see uh, John Keats, who developed uh, tuberculosis at a young age. He was a lunger. And uh, you know, once again, I can't read all this stuff, but just every page is packed with so many goofy, crazy jokes. I did want to point out that little, that's pretty amazing, this shit. 
And John Keats was just this pathetic guy, died young. He was in love with this woman who didn't love him back forever. And the cause of death? Poetry. And last we have Edgar Allan Poe. You probably know about Edgar Allan Poe. He, he fell in love with this 13 year old, a 13 year old. I think it was his cousin. Yeah, like a second cousin. Oh no, his first cousin. Just fucked up. He just was, did not have a happy life. Total alcoholic. And the cause of death, once again, poetry. For me, four men foolish enough to flirt with the muse. Four men damned to misery, poverty, and death. Poetry does not pay. <laughs> I love that format for just uh, an excuse to tell uh, the true stories of poets. So here we have the last chapter of Americaville. Here's that narrator again, the stage manager. And we see that, uh, let's just call her the Bruja. Because she looks like some crazy witch. If it is a woman, I can't, still can't tell if it's a man or a woman. And uh, they find this, like, uh, Barbie-type doll. But the face is a skull. And they have this really odd conversation, which I don't really understand. But I think um, they represent America, this doll. Oh, this is a very short chapter. And then she basically uh, breaks the fourth wall and she does something that's not in the script and she says throttle the damn script this whole story absolutely sucks talking about Americaville and the doll says you're a silent character you don't speak and she says I gotta call the emperor's bluff the emperor wears no clothes this trip is ridiculous <laughs> and she basically says cut Cut, cut. She basically forces it into the strip. And then we see a bunch of the various characters who we've seen, the, the naked couple. We had good reviews. And the wife says, one. <laughs> and uh, this guy says, great. There goes my big bedroom seat in issue number five. And she says, I'm not the continuity thief. I'm not in charge. Blame the narrator. And the narrator passes the buck. He says, blame the damn creator. And we see a photo of Jeremy Eaton. <laughs> it says Americaville will continue, but I don't think it did. Maybe it did. Who knows? But this is a pretty conclusive ending. I love this idea of like doing this weird Lynchian type strip. And then at the end, just saying, this is fucking nonsense. What the fuck am I kidding? because <laughs> I mean those kind of surreal stories are fun to tell I mean it's fun just making up crazy nonsense as long as it's interesting you know and you don't have to have an ending you don't have to have like real developed characters but he totally calls himself out in it not many artists do that in fact none have and it comes to a screeching halt once again another ad that is actually kind of a Extra page of cool art and funny, uh, funny text. Giant six foot inflatable grinning hobo. This is a fun back cover. 10 reasons why I should get to draw the Ghost Rider from Marvel Comics Group by Jeremy Eaton, age 12. So, this is a, like that earlier strip about the stained glass, all the lots of misspellings. And I'm pretty sure he these are drawn for this comic. But maybe he did really draw these back when he was 12. I don't know. It does look like something a little kid would draw. Skulls are easy to do is one reason. Hell is interesting and very imaginative. And then his number eight, Power Man has a big butt. This drawing of Luke Cage is so funny to me. The kid says, you're stupid and you don't have real supervillains. 
I would love like just I I hope he has more of these like you know young uh, pre adolescent musings. Pretty funny stuff. So there you go, guys. What not number one through four. These comics are t definitely not hard to find. Well, they might be. They they sold so badly, they might have all been pulped. But if you do find them, they won't be expensive. Nobody gave a shit about this guy at all. I was always amazed. Uh, I think his sleepyhead collections didn't do well. And I think Jeremy Eaton is so fucking talented. But it seems like he barely made a blip on anyone's radar in comics. I mean, he was published by Fanagraphics. He was given the forum. But nobody seemed to care. And... Uh, Except for maybe me and a few other people. But I think this guy's really clever, amazing, great cartoon, great cartoonist. I love his uh, style, except for that fourth issue. So I don't know what happened with that fourth issue. I'm very curious. I wonder if he just ran out of time and did a looser style because it would be quicker. Or if he was just changing his whole direction and uh, just wanted to have a totally new uh, look. Who knows? But I definitely like the first two issues more. So thanks for watching this video, guys. And I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.